Okay, great. Um, yeah, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for waiting in the line. Um, yeah, lucky you made it. Um, great, yeah, look, thanks so much for coming. Uh, my name is Ben Strick. I've been here a couple of years now, banging on about open source, and I think once upon a time I came here, there were like 15 people in the room, and now there's so many more people, so it's so cool to see, so thanks for coming. Thanks for growing the community, um, you know, sharing and everything like that, so it's really cool. Um, Reid and I are going to bang on a fair bit today, fairly quickly, because we want to make this as productive as possible for you guys, with tools, with case studies, dropping links, and we'll also have a summary of the links at the end. So just in case you don't get time to write it down, take a photo, or you don't want to come and harass me over a coffee, which I always love, um, we'll have a slide at the end for all the tools. Uh, but today I'm joined with my colleague Reid. Reid? Hi everyone, I'm Reid Levinson. I do visual investigations at Reuters News. I've been doing it for about eight years, um, but really only done visual investigations since I took a Bellingcat course in 2019. So anyone can start at any time. And uh, I'm gonna talk about some of the stories we've done using open source tools. Great, um, just for those of you wondering, so I'm with CIR, funny little acronym right there. Um, so it's called Center for Information Resilience. It's a not-for-profit based in the UK. Uh, but when I talk about the case studies today, I'm mentioning CIR because we have 200 people across the globe, from Myanmar, from Sudan, from Afghanistan, from other places that are really struggling with these things and using open source to document what happens in their hometowns, in their homes and in their communities as well. So while I'm standing up here, I'm not the only one doing the work, there are so many behind it and really I'll, I'll try and hat tip as many uh, people as possible. Uh, but really going through that. So just wanted to kind of mention uh, who CIR is. Um, before we kick off, we have a graphic warning. So we don't talk about cats and dogs, unfortunately, and finding them stuck in trees. I'd love to do that for a living. Um, but we talk about, obviously, human rights abuses, right? We try to use open source where facts are distorted on the ground during war zones and during conflicts and human rights abuses. So this is really crucial that I wanted to kind of share with you guys that we do have a graphic warning. We will be talking about graphic content, but we'll blur that and mitigate that as much as possible. So obviously there's a lot of super important people in the room today, very productive people, so we want to be as productive as possible with this. So what will this session cover? We're going to go through three main things. First, how does open source look like in a story? Because we're all journalists, right? We want to know how to use data in storytelling. Second, we're going to look at what data do we have access to. So Reid is going to go through some awesome data sets and tools. So that's a really good time to just take lots of photos of the screen if you want, instead of writing it down and zip through them later. And then third, we're going to go through a case study and look at how we actually do the work by thinking about those journalistic questions like where, when, what, and obviously the most important one, why is this important, right? Zooming out, showing that strength of open source by showing the bigger picture as well. So first of all, I, I wanted to start with a, a case study and then I'll pass on to Reid. And it's about a country uh, called Myanmar. Um, it's a place that's quite close to my heart because there is a strong Myanmar OSINC community as well. Uh, some of you have worked on Myanmar in, in, in the past, I'm, I'm sure, in the room. I know the fact that some of you have. Uh, but I'm going to show you a specific case study around an airstrike that happened earlier this year. Um, it was quite an awful airstrike, but I'm going to play it. Just a triggering alert, there will be the sound of a bomb that goes off in, in a few seconds. You would have noticed that those people started running before the bomb went off. As soon as they see an aeroplane flying that low over, we might stop, we might take a photo on Instagram or film it on TikTok because it's, hey, it's cool, there's a jet flying over. Those people run for cover. That's daily life. It's not a unique video. It happens every single day. But I'm going to take you through the process of what we do to verify that. It's also kind of annoying, that one, because it hit a school, it hit a church, it killed women and children, and then we saw this pop up on state media. This is kind of the, the North Korean-esque state media of Myanmar military, or the Myanmar government. This person is specifically saying that the immediate reports by brave journalists on the ground 
were actually terrorist news outlets pressing fake news, sharing fake ideas about a bombing that happened. Again, using that fake news brand that we all believe in, but they're using it to counter claims on the ground. They also said that there was no plane flying over, that the footage was fake, and everything like that. So we start to think to ourselves, okay, already we're in an environment of narratives distorting facts on the ground. How do we go through this? This is the power of open source. So first of all, we answer the question of where was it filmed? And we use things like Google Maps that you might find for a nearby cafe or a restaurant tonight, um, and Google Earth as well. We always want to know where was the video filmed from, right? So we're looking for reference points. Trees, houses, buildings, streets. Where can we match these buildings and these trees on satellite imagery as well? It's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle, right? Where's Wally? Has anyone played Where's Wally before? Like on the book, yeah? Yeah, a few nods. I actually did it with my partner about two weeks ago. It's kind of cool, so we still do this. So we're trying to figure out where was this video filmed from, right? It's not only that one, but then we want to see where did the bomb land as well. So we're moving forward down the street and having a look at maybe where did it land and what did it strike. So we have some footage from the aftermath as well that we're able to pick up online. And we can start to match some of these buildings, but also identify that there's two separate clusters of buildings that were hit here, the ones on the left and the ones on the right. The ones on the right, one of them was a Baptist church. There's a a lot of churches around Myanmar, some of them are quite beautiful buildings. And then another one was a school behind it as well, a very large building that you can see there with a, a, a sports yard in the middle. And so you can see that there's two separate buildings that have been hit. They don't really look like military targets. So we're, we're always thinking with that biased sense of could it be a military target? Could this be a proportional strike? The lucky thing that we had after this case, and this is the power of open source, is that if you've used Google Earth, has anyone used Google Earth here, the desktop version? I'm sure there's heaps that, yeah, great, like, see some waves. So Google Earth actually uploaded a satellite image a week after this event, brand new image the day after the strike. So when people say, oh, Google Earth hasn't got recent imagery, it actually does. This is going in Myanmar. It's not at the top of priority of Google to update. But they gave us recent satellite imagery so we can see in clear detail what buildings were struck. And you can see that quite clearly there. I'll give you a before and after. There's the 15th of January, there's a before. So you can see those chunks missing. Again, that before and after game that we're playing, right? This visual proof that something did happen on the ground. A strike did happen. Explosions did happen. That also helps us with our answering that question of when did it happen. So at least we've got a date range between the 3rd and 8th of January. But we also want to know who is responsible, right? That's the biggest question that everyone has. Who's the person we, we can nail against the wall with this data? So in this video, we see a split frame right here of a plane flying over. Remember, the Myanmar government said, aha, no planes flying over. Ah, got you there. This is actually one of the few planes that the Myanmar Air Force has in its possession, the Chinese aircraft, the Q-5 aircraft. It's a fighter jet that they use quite regularly in bombings. So what we like to do is think about what other data can we identify? Maybe nearby air bases, for example. So 300 kilometers away, there was an air base that we had to look at and looked at different satellite imagery from. And we can actually see figures that look similar to this Q-5 jet. Same kind of outlines, the same measurements of wings and things like that, and the same colors. That was an image on the 7th of January, around the same time as the strike. Now that's kind of interesting, but we want to go a little bit further than that. I don't know if you guys, if anyone here is a war geek, and you look at YouTube, and you look at like war videos, maybe for your research, or maybe just for fun, uh, looking at tanks and stuff. There's a lot of people that like to upload this stuff on YouTube. Um, and it's also easy to train your algorithm to get belt-fed videos from Myanmar about military equipment. Woohoo! Um, so this is actually an Air Force channel that we discovered on YouTube. Um, and it basically showcases a lot of the new aircraft and fighter jets that the Myanmar military, uh, the Myanmar Air Force had in its possession. And these are certain jets, and you can see the color scheme of these jets, the wing shape as well. So it really helped us further confirm the kind of profile of these jets at this, uh, at this place, but also by cross-referencing that video on the ground against what it looked like from above on satellite imagery. So again, taking you from the ground to above, the ground to above. 
and that way of matching profiles, which is always super helpful. Now, I've shown you a lot of cool data, a lot of cool boxes. Um, there's actually a couple of the designers that worked on this video in the room. So, Suze and Jay are sitting up the back. They're really super shy, but I'll point them out anyway. If you want to learn about some of these kind of visual storytelling techniques, please hit them up later. You can maybe stand up if you want, Suze. Haha, -ha, gotcha. <laughs> um, and I've, so, we've shown you like a lot of cool little bits of data, right? Really sexy kind of open source. But at the heart of this and at the heart of all of our stories, is human stories and human lives on the ground, right? And so here's a doctor that rocked up to the school. She spoke about the children that were killed, the bodies that she treated after this as well. And this is kind of the heartfelt story that we deal with every single day, is documenting that human story as well as that verification story. Remember, digital investigations powered by human stories. That's going to be the theme of what we talk about with Reid and I today. On the left, you can see that this isn't just human stories in a, in a small kind of sense. As a zoomed out picture, we can see that this happens over and over again. So in 2022, we commissioned a study through our Burmese team to have a look at other airstrikes that happened in the last six months of 2022. More than 135 airstrikes alone. So that's 135 times what I just showed you then. Human stories, children being killed, people being targeted. And every time those airstrikes happen, we do those cool little geolocation graphics. They look cool. They're not showing cool stuff, right? But we try to verify this content because we know the government will deny it. And obviously, we share a lot of that with media because we're a not-for-profit agency. We can work with media outlets to empower those stories and really get those stories out. Our belief is that we are trying to focus on not providing English content. So you see an English Western person up here. Most of our content is published in Burmese. We are a primarily Burmese organization at Myanmar Witness. These are people that have fled the country and have picked up a keyboard, not a gun. And so we publish this content in Burmese on social media groups like Facebook. So if everyone's thinking that OSINT is dead on Twitter, head to Facebook and look at Burmese because there is some awesome stuff on there. And I think I just wanted to kind of end on this specific case study with a little story about the community as well. You can see the two images on the right are hackathons or research events, research boot camps that we do, which is basically getting down and looking at all of these airstrikes one by one, event by event, with the whole Burmese community based in certain parts of Thailand or other places like that. The interesting thing is, is that you see them blurred on the right and you see two of the researchers who are in our team on the left wearing disguises because that's the power of open source. These people can't be brave like putting their name out there or revealing their details or attending a journalism festival. They have to wear disguises because their families will be persecuted in the country, right? But the content that they provide is open source. It's verifiable, it's transparent, and the techniques behind it are quite amazing. And again, it allows them to pick up a keyboard and not a rifle. Cool, we're gonna see some other research shared by Reid. Hey guys. So Ben at CIR and his colleagues, they focus on creating these phenomenal resources using open source footage that let anyone uh, around the world investigate human rights abuses. So I'm going to focus on what we do at Reuters, which is to combine some of those same open source tools and resources with traditional reporting. So some of you might be familiar. I don't know how many are old school reporters versus new age reporters, but we do a lot of source testimony, witness testimony, and sort of combining the two. So I'm going to go into two case studies from this series we did in Nigeria and talk about how we really melded the two uh, to document human rights abuses in the northeast of Nigeria. Uh, so, my colleagues and I spent about three years investigating atrocities committed by the Nigerian military in their campaign against Boko Haram in the Northeast. So, if you're not familiar with the conflict, since about 2009, the Nigerian military has been fighting an Islamist insurgency in the Northeast. Uh, it was Boko Haram, now it's ISWAP, Islamic State, West Africa province. And um, this is Nigeria and West Africa, and the conflict is mostly taking place in these uh, regions up north. So among our stories, we uncovered a mass abortion program run by the Nigerian army to terminate the pregnancies of at least 10,000 women and girls. And we also reported on the practice of the Nigerian military to kill men and young boys 
who they suspected of being terrorists. Uh, sometimes they were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. There was also a belief, there is a belief among military that children born of Islamist fathers will go on to be terrorists. Um, so sometimes there's no reason for this. And throughout the process, we learned to mix open source reporting with traditional reporting, not just at the end to pull the story together, but really day by day as we went about reporting. There are some open source techniques that helped us in this part of the world where um, there oftentimes isn't maps. There's tools that Ben talked about. Not all of them apply depending where in the world you're reporting, right? So I'm going to walk you to, through two stories that relied heavily on these open source tools. And the first example was... Uh, the main story we talked about for this piece on the practice of killing children. So we reported on a massacre that took place of children, teenagers, and young men um, in Kukawa in Borno State in Nigeria. Um, as many of you know, trauma affects memory, and this makes our job difficult. Oftentimes, as journalists, the people we're talking to, they can't necessarily describe where and when with enough specificity that we need to verify what they're saying. And also, in this part of Nigeria, the people that we were talking to, they didn't have the map literacy that we might be used to. So what I mean by that is you and I are used to thinking in miles and kilometers because we map a run or we map our favorite coffee shop. Or like I live in London, and if I'm describing a place, I might say it's north of the river or it's south of the river. We describe things in terms of these coordinates we're used to. So that makes mapping easily easier. But in this part of Nigeria, the people that we were talking to, they couldn't uh, they couldn't go from on the ground to sort of more satellite thinking as, <laughs> as we're used to, thank you. Um, and also this part of Nigeria, it's not very well mapped. So that means that you know, there aren't any Yelp reviews of places that could help us verify testimony, right? There's also not a Google Street View. And more than that, there aren't landmarks. Uh, so when people would tell us, for example, that these children were gathered at the main meat market, before they were taken to what would then become a mass grave. We didn't know where that was. So we didn't know, do we have two sources on this location, right? Because different people have different names for things. So we had to think outside the box. Uh, I started with this tool, Google My Maps. Has anyone used Google My Maps before? So one cool thing in the Google Drive suite is you can build your own map. And we actually use this in Northeast Nigeria to build our own map based on source testimony. So I. I drew this map of what we did know, what was available online, of this town in Kukawa. And we actually had my colleagues print this out. So uh, they printed out a black and white version. And my colleagues, Paul, Libby, and David, when they were doing interviews with sources on the ground, they would fill out this map. And what they would ask, we had to change the way that we were asking sources questions. So instead of saying, is this to the east? Is this to the west? We would describe things in the direction of towns they might have walked to. And we would ask them, as you're walking to cross Kauua, for example, from your house, what do you see on the right? What do you see on the left? And this helped us build our own map through hours and hours of interviews of what this town looked like, because it just wasn't available online. And I took uh, almost a dozen of these maps, and I built a map of Kukawa with the landmarks that we knew from multiple source testimonies, and that allowed us to then verify what people were saying about where something was. And that also allowed us to find this mass grave out east, uh, out west, excuse me, based on uh, so many interviews. And we could follow people along as they described walking to this grave because we had located all of those maps, all, all of those landmarks in a map. So that's an example of how even simple tools can really advance your reporting when you're covering a part of the world where, for example, there aren't maps of the landmarks you need. So I also want to go in depth on another story we did. This was a collaboration with Bellingcat, and I want to give a shout out to Yuri and Carlos and Lucy of Bellingcat, who were incredible reporting partners and actually sadly aren't at Perugia this year. So hopefully I do their work justice. So I want to talk about this story, which is also part of the same series. It's along a similar theme, but we used very different tools for this. So we received this 25-second video from two separate sources. I'm not going to play it here because it is quite gruesome. Um, but I have a sort of a screen-by-screen screen so you can see what happened. You see a man in army fatigues shooting a young, a young man in blue shorts. He's obviously a detainee. He's been held in the back of this truck and he's being shot, and we don't see any scenes of fighting, right? So it looks like we've captured a war crime on video. And we really wanted to know 
where did this take place, when did this take place, and why? Similar questions that Ben is asking at CIR, right? But we had an issue in that we had no idea when this had happened or where. So it made our job building a sourcing network difficult. And unfortunately, there were so many stories as we talked to sources about young men being killed in similar situations that as we were asking around, we didn't have enough to go on, right? Someone might have remembered something that happened in 2016 in a totally different part of the country. Someone remembered something that happened in 2020. And we didn't know where to start building our sourcing network. So I approached Bellingcat. And they started with something very clever and very simple doing a reverse image search. So instead of trying to geolocate in this entire region in Northeast Nigeria, and maybe it wasn't in Nigeria, right? They started with a image reverse search. So has anyone used image reverse search? Yeah, quite common, right? I would have never thought to use that to try and figure out where this video was taking place. So they tried to use a screenshot of the video, but it was too low resolution. So they looked for similar photos of different conflicts in the Northeast of Nigeria, and they found this image online. Similar, it's a guy in blue shorts, Nigerian soldiers in the back, and they used that as their input for reverse image searching. And doing that, they found this image, which seems to be of the same boy here in blue shorts, young man in blue shorts, excuse me. Um, and what you see here are dozens of bodies and lots of guys in military fatigues. So still we wanted to know how do we verify this is the same scene, right? So we started by comparing the guy on the ground in blue shorts with our man from the video. And pretty soon we could see a lot of similarities, right? Blue shorts have three white stripes, the same as this guy in the video. Also, there's a similar wound on the hand. Sorry for the gore here. Uh, similar markings on the legs. So we thought, this is probably our guy, but is it the same location? How do we know it was the same day? So what I like to do when I'm geolocating a video is I like to do this sort of panorama. So I take screenshots frame by frame in the video and I piece them together and I find it's an easier way to look at the whole picture. And doing this, you can see here with this overlay, we were able to see that the pictures posted online of these bodies were taken in the same place, perhaps at a later point, as the video that we had. So the next step was trying to figure out, okay, where is this location? So using geolocation, right, we're looking for, in this overlay here, we're looking for the same trees, you know, the same white stones, the same wall in the back, so similar things as Ben is doing in Myanmar. And we saw that this video and the photos posted online were taken right outside a military barracks uh, in Borno State. And this, is a, this was a also an example of how we mixed our reporting on the ground with what we had from the video and what we had from these photos that Bellingcat found. So we used source testimony to also verify this location. And what we learned from sources is that these white stones, they're indicative of the roads leading up to milita military facilities. So it's another example of how you know, open source and traditional reporting, they can help corroborate each other. So we wanted to know when did the killing take place, right? Because it seemed like from the video that this was outside of any fighting, but we wanted to verify that. So has anyone, is anyone familiar with SunCalc? Yeah, this is a great resource, and um, Carlos, I have to say, is very, very good at it. <laughs> so using SunCalc and the stills from the video, he was able to determine that the time of the shooting to around noon. And that was really interesting because Again, going back to open source, we had looked at photos and videos posted online by residents, by family, and friends um, of the events that day in Bew. And you can see here, some people even posted photos that included our guy in blue shorts. And what's really interesting is over here on the right, if you can see this tweet from the Nigerian headquarters. So this is an official military Twitter account, and they talk about a mopping up operation taking place the time is from my computer, so it's an hour behind, but a mopping up operation taking place around 11.30. So interesting, right? Because now we know the video was filmed around noon, but they had already started to conclude military uh, action around 11.30. So that suggested to us that maybe this guy was killed after all the fighting had ended. So this, again, we are combining open source techniques with our sourcing on the ground. So together with all of these tweets and Facebook posts, we were able to piece together a full timeline, a real blow-by-blow blow of events that day. And we could say 
This paragraph we ended up having in the story that the slaying likely occurred at the same time or after defense headquarters said that the attack had been repelled. So that's another kind of proof that this was likely a war crime that took place after the fighting had finished. So the last question, as Ben said, the most important question is who did this, right? So we wanted to figure out who did this. And luckily, uh, Nigerian soldiers love to post on Facebook. So this guy, Emmanuel Emeka, um, Bellingcat found him. He had been posting selfies in the field for years. Uh, here's one of them. And I don't know if you can see from back there, but on the butt of his rifle, it says 231. So this identifies him as a member of the 231 Tank Battalion, one of the two battalions that was based in Bue, right? So it wasn't enough for us to just know these two battalions are based there. We wanted to know, did they participate in events that day? So Emmanuel posted this photo of himself posing in front of the bodies. This is actually the same scene, the same location as the video and as some of those other photos we saw earlier. And he wrote, uh, he's an ambassador of peace. We kill so that you may live, God is witness. We've blurred most of the bodies, but if you can see on the left here, I don't know if this pointer is gonna show you, that head that's just visible on the end, that's our guy in blue shorts. And how do we know that? Because he actually posted two photos in front of the bodies that day. Here's this guy in blue shorts. He's proud of his work. He's thinking of killing more people, he posted. So he actually posted these photos a month later, but because of these techniques I've been going through, we knew that this was taken the same day, it's the same scene, it's our same guy here in blue shorts. So um, yeah, this is an example, again, of how you can use a whole array of techniques to tell a really powerful story. In this case, we were able to document a war crime that was caught on video. Thanks. Some brilliant cases from Reed there. And you can also see that in an area that's probably assumed to be quite dry of data in sub-Saharan Africa, just how much information is available to tell a story and answer who might be responsible for something. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Sudan, and I'm conscious of time, so we'll belt through this at a rapid pace. Uh, but for those of you that don't know what's going in Sudan, there is a civil war happening. This is a very basic version of what should be explained over a, over a week or two weeks, and there's probably people in the room that can explain it better than me. Uh, but there is a civil war going on. There is increased famine. There is increased tribal militia warring as well, um, and, and an incredible amount of horrible stories coming out of it. Uh, but before I tuck into Sudan, I want to ask, does anyone recognize this thing on the screen up here? Any hands? Yeah, cool. What have you used it for? To see some wood burnings in Germany. I didn't even plan that answer. That is perfect. That's what I wanted someone to say. Thank you. So some people use it to see deforestation fires or wood burnings. I'm going to show you how we use it to identify when villages have been burnt down and targeted through certain attacks. Um, so this is FIRMS. It's a website by NASA. You can type it in, F-I-R-M-S, like the, the strength that I have by gripping this microphone right now. Uh, so it's FIRM, Fire Information Resource Management System. And basically it indicates heat signatures around the world, either from yesterday, five days ago, uh, six months ago, over a window of time. And it's a really useful site. But when I show you this, I'm not saying that the whole world is on fire, even though it might look like that, might feel like that according to social media. These are just heat signatures over a month period. Um, but the availability of it is that it's quite interactive. You can zoom in, you can narrow down your window of time, and you can really identify certain things. For example, this is Khartoum over a period of a month in May 16, 2023. So a month, either, uh, two weeks either side of that. So it's a very interactive website and very useful to use. And so these are the kind of things that we're seeing, right? We hop on a village and we see that there are a number of burn uh, uh, heat signatures over that village. And we think to ourselves, what is the story behind that red box? That bit of data that everyone looks for so much. What is the human story behind that? And we're seeing this over and over again. Uh, this might be some loud footage, so you can turn it down, sorry. Left that um, these are some of the stories that we're seeing from that. The videos on the left and the far right uh, show a militia tribe 
that is pro RSF or allied with the RSF, the Rapid Support Forces, basically attacking a village, stealing its grain, its animals, its vehicles, its solar panels, and leaving that village left to burnt to the ground. In the middle is the one filmed by two individuals who left with their donkey on the side, and they're basically watching from a cliff face this village burn nearby. Uh, for those of you that are looking at Sudan, you're probably not going to find too much on Twitter or Facebook, but you're probably going to find a lot on TikTok. So this is the kind of new generation of social media uh, that uh, Reid will be going into in a little bit around really gathering some of that information from multiple social media resources, not just the kind of mainstream ones. So when we look at the human story of that, how on earth as a team, and this is from a, I'm going to talk a little bit about our project, Sudan Witness, we have 12 people alone just watching Sudan. That may sound like a lot, but it is very much not enough going through and looking at the human story behind every single village, every single day that's burnt down. So how can we go through this a little bit better? Well, you might have seen on the screen there, we have the firm shot over Sudan, and then I popped on some little black circles. Usually, we'd have a human being, I like to refer to people as humans, uh, scroll in and scroll out and verify each little red dot and search as a story of what's happened underneath it or what was that indicating? Was it a forest fire or was it actually a village attack indicating mass death and mass events? So what we like to do is create little circles around villages and we automatically identify when there is a burn mark or a heat signature within that little circle. That's called a little bit of automation. It stops us from doing those manual processes over and over so that we can narrow down that window of data and start to identify micro bits of data. But we can do that a little bit better. Oh, that's a dark shot down the bottom. Um, we can do that a little bit better. So after we narrow down those little circles to identify heat signatures in villages, we then use an automated process to identify the difference in satellite images. So remember I went through satellite imagery before, uh, showing before and after destruction. Same thing happens here. On the top left, you'll see an image before. On the top right, you'll see an image after fires happened. Now it's not very obvious in there but you can see the main road in the middle there's a bit of darkness, a bit of charring. That was a school, a heap of residential areas and a government area that was basically burnt to the ground in a place called El Janina. Now I probably the contrast is a little bit different but trust me there are satellite images at the bottom and I created those satellite images using the burned area index on Sentinel Hub. Freely available satellite image, anyone can use this. Sentinel Hub is a beautiful resource because it democratizes satellite filtering. It allows you to apply those smart little satellite bands that you would see geospatial scientists use at the click of a button. So the bottom one allows me to identify heat signatures or, or, or sorry, burned areas after a burning. And so we're allowed to, we can actually automate that process a little bit more. This is that buzzword that people use called AI. I like to just refer to it as a little bit of automated steps, but we still have a human being at the end of it, right? So I can't say AI, and I think that's a horrible word to use, but we're using some automation to really go through this so that we don't have human beings zooming in and out of red dots every day verifying a fire, but rather now we have a list of burned villages that we can zoom into and start to look at that human story. And that's where I get into the hard stuff, which is the footage on the ground and the human stories of a lot of death. We can see the fires burning in the background. Um, lots of people tell me that there's not much footage coming out of Sudan. These are four videos from one village attack. There is a lot. The funny thing is they're not videos that are filmed by people in the village. It's perpetrator film footage which is something we rely upon a lot. So when I say thanks to the brave individuals that film the footage, I'm not referring to perpetrators at all, trust me on that. Uh, but we can see a fire that happens in the background after this village raid. And this is interesting because this is actually having a zoom out effect of looking at all that data. These are multiple fires, about seven to eight villages that were burnt in one single day as a convoy drove its way through goes to that village, picks up all the grain, burns it down, drives to the next village, burns, picks up all the grain, kills everyone, burns it down, and basically tries to recruit people as well. You can see on the left, we've got even some of the footage attached where we've got time markers of where that convoy was when it burnt that village down and how it drove north and then burnt that next village down. So we're really able to tell so much just out of the power of a zoomed out red dot as well. 
even to the point where we can identify where perhaps who might be responsible. Is it militia allied to the RSF? And we can identify that by the little white tags that they attach. So you saw Reed, how she was looking at these unique identifiers, these little objects, these little tokens, little data nuggets, we like to call them. These are little white tags that villagers add or, or militia adds when they basically want to align with a certain group and say, ha-ha, I'm part of your party now. And so, so they're all adding them, which is quite an interesting aspect to work towards that attribution. Now, I've shown you so much data, and you know this is a, a village in West Darfur called El Janina. I added that Darfurian music in there on purpose. Um, and this is an interesting one. So we have firms, heat signatures on the left, satellite imagery on the top, videos at the bottom. There's so much data going in, which is why we like to create these visual maps, right? And the visual cues are the power of telling open source data because you can't look at a spreadsheet all day long, but when you look at the zoomed out picture with all of it, it tells a beautiful story. And this is actually a map made by one of our amazing Sudanese analysts. Uh, I can't tell you their names on uh, the live stream here. Don't know who's listening. Um, but if you come up to me later, I'll show you their Twitter handles and you can see some of the maps they make. They're absolutely beautiful in their graphics. Um, probably the most talented map makers I've met. Uh, from, yeah, and, and yeah. Um, so that basically tells the story of El Janina. With all of this data, we've automated it. We're not greedy. We like to share in the open source community. So we've made a publicly available map. You can find it, FireMap Sudan, um, Center for Information Resilience. And basically we upload this every, uh, we refresh it every single week with a feed of all of the data points that we identify of villages that have been burnt down, the attached satellite images and the videos as well. So we make this a public resource to empower reporting and keep Sudan in the headlines, which is so crucial for us as well. Great, I'll hand over to Reid to go through some data at a belt feed rate. Okay, I'm gonna speed through this, guys, so we have some time for questions. Um, so I'm gonna go through some tools, again, just some tools, uh, that we have access to as open source researchers. So to start with, news, especially local news, can be a really great starting point for your investigation. Oftentimes we get on stories because we read something that's been published and we think, is there more to this story, right? Social media, uh, every year it seems there's a new platform. Uh, ben was just talking about TikTok. Here is a guy who likes to harass women online, posting a photo of himself on Facebook. Uh, ben was able to geolocate this guy uh, develop, uh, sorry, delivering weapons to Libya. So some people put a lot online. Uh, flight traffic data. I like to follow Taylor Swift jets tracking. People are also probably familiar with Elon Musk's jet because of the court case. There's a lot available on Flight Radar 24, Flight Aware, ADSB Exchange, sites like that. Maritime traffic data, so ships also are tracked. More and more we see ships spoofing their data, but still it is a great resource. If anyone knows Yorick Isaac, the Bosphorus observer, he likes to follow ships, especially ships that are up to no good. Aquasis is a great resource for looking at ship ownership and obviously marine traffic. Uh, geospatial data. So a lot is available online. Here is an app for rating beer um, where you can find people like CIA uh, CIA staff posting about the beer they like. So there's a lot online. Um, Strava, obviously some stories about US military bases. Uh, here is a US military base in Cameroon. And also, uh, yeah, people's runs. This is a guy who likes to run fun shapes around London and post about it online. So crowdsource data can also be a little bit more analytical. So if anyone's familiar with Wikimapia, yeah see some head nods. So this is like Wikipedia for maps, super useful. There are also categories of locations that people have crowdsourced. So here is grain silos in Kyiv identified in Wikimapia. So I, this is a great resource. Satellite sense data, so NASA firms as Ben talked about, also for more data nerds out there. Google Earth Engine has tons of catalogs of different geo uh, data sets that you can use to look at pollution or uh, deforestation, things like that. Satellite imagery, obviously we have free high-res images on Google Earth. Uh, you can go back in time, look at historical and how things have changed. This is a US Air Force base in Afghanistan. We also have, uh, here we go. Also, when you're looking for satellite imagery, it's useful to go to different providers. Here on the left, you can see a lower resolution image in Israel on Google Earth, and here is the Israeli government's version, their satellite image. So it's useful to look around at other providers, not only to see what else is out there, if you can get higher res, but also to compare and to verify the imagery you're working with. 
So we also have free low resolution images like Sentinel Hub, like Ben talked about. You can apply filters to look for things like fires. We have paid high resolution images. So this is a Maxar image in Mariupol of the theater that was bombed. We also have paid low resolution images. So Planet, which also has high res, but they also have lower res images. And this is a, Air For a Russian Air Force base in just on the border with Ukraine. And you can see even with lower resolution images, you can make out this smoke plume from missiles being fired, right? So low resolution can still tell you a lot. And we have other data. So this is freely available CCTV footage of Russian soldiers building a base. Um, there's a lot out there. So that was a rapid fire session on what data we have available. Um, I wanted to quickly just cover uh, how we actually do the work and really spell it out a bit more. A lot of people think there's a lot of magic behind open source. Actually, it's probably a factor of time and persistence, right? Um, there is a, what I like to call a bit of an arms race between newsrooms at the moment to train up algorithms, use machine learning and show off some cool tricks. But at the end of the day, some of the best work is the original open source work, right? The stuff that takes time and the simple stuff that doesn't take away from the human story. Um, and so I'm really going to focus on a little bit just on a brief case study, uh, which I spoke about actually in Perugia in 2019. Um, around this case that emerged from Cameroon. Um, some of you might have seen this one before. It's on uh, YouTube. I think it's been used by a zillion people as a training material product. Um, this probably explains why it gets so many views each month. Uh, but it's called Anatomy of a Killing. And basically this footage surfaced online in 2018 and it shows these women and children being walked down this dusty path by these individuals that look quite strong, quite intimidating with their uniforms, with their aviator sunglasses, stereotypical bad guy sunglasses, carrying weapons and things like that. And they're slapping these women as they walk them down. I don't have the audio on this, but they say basically, you are biatch, which is uh, uh, Boko Haram. It's a shortened version of that. And they make a left turn and they walk them off the side of the path. And you can notice one of them has a baby on her back, the other one carrying her little girl in her hand and they eventually kneel them down, they blindfold them, and they shoot them 21 times. And I'm not gonna play that footage for you, but it's quite awful. Um, again, similar circumstance to what I showed you at the start of this presentation. The government said it was fake news, right? Of course they're gonna dismiss this and try and throw it under the carpet. So the power of open source comes out through persistence and time, and it took us three months to work on this investigation in total. It took about a week alone just of scrolling around on Google Earth to find this location. But essentially the government tried to misprove it on a couple of points by saying it, wasn't, it didn't happen in the north, it wasn't Cameroonian soldiers, they didn't have those weapon systems and things like that. So we're gonna prove them wrong. And first of all, we're gonna look at where it was filmed. Again, that crucial journalistic question, where did it happen? We look at things in the background. So if you're in Paris and you've got the Eiffel Tower, it's probably Paris. Here we have a mountain, okay, we can't really say it's a mountainous area, but maybe it gives us a reference point on where to look for. By scrolling around on Google Earth, as we looked at before, we can see the 3D elevation range of mountains, and we can maybe try and match up the fatigue of that mountain with the mountain range right here. And for those of you that like geolocation and you get that dopamine hit, be prepared to fall off your seat. So we can see this mountain range right here, and we can see that profile, and it almost fits quite perfectly. So we have that nice little kind of verification to say, yep, we've got that mountain range. It's on the border of Nigeria and Cameroon in a village called Kwaramafa, specifically in the north of Cameroon. We're able to start answering that question a little bit more by looking in the detail of this, by looking at buildings like this uh, street as well, this, this road, I should call it, with a little curved, unique line. We've got these buildings over here. We have these buildings on the other side. But we also have quite a few trees to look at. So this was something I made at about 3 o'clock one morning when I was a little bit overhyped on coffee. And you can see every single tree matches up in the panorama on Google Earth as well. So we actually really nailed that question of where did it happen. By looking at when it happened, first of all, we can use satellite imagery, right? You go back in time, you see if something's there. You go forward in time, you see if something's not there. This building was not there in 2014. So we slide, slid back and said, okay, we have a window starting at 2014. We moved forward and we saw that this little grain stack over here 
It was there in 2014, but not there in 2016. So we have a window of two years on to work on, which is between 2014 and 2016. Now, human rights abusers, in my opinion, are pretty useless and they should be thrown in jail, but this one was useful because we could use him as a sundial, like the kind of ugly concrete object you see in a park. We turned him into a sub sundial by measuring the shadow that he had, identifying the angle of sunlight, and using that to identify a certain window of time, specifically around March and April within that window of time. And that was quite useful because we were able to answer that second question, where, uh, when did it happen? Now that crucial question, who? By following up and having a look at certain weapon systems that the Cameroonian military said that they didn't have, we can already identify special forces posing here with the Zastava M21 of a certain group. This is a special forces group brought in to combat terrorism, apparently. Uh, again, posing on Facebook. The Cameroonian uh, government also said they didn't wear these uniforms. Haha, there's a heap of guys posing in bases nearby with these uniforms on as well. There's even one guy doing push-ups. Uh, without a T-shirt on uh, at, at some point. You can see them. Um, so these are the individuals. We were able to name them through the BBC as well, which takes a lot of evidence to name an individual. But that was quite useful, all of that evidence, to go and, and really give that name to them. When we published that afterwards in September 2020, these four individuals were sentenced to 10 years in jail, which in my opinion is not enough. But it really shows the strength of some of this work here. So wrapping up a little bit quickly, why is this public data important? Well, you can see some of the kind of headlines that have been attributed to through open source information. But it's really helpful to fight disinformation and propaganda and that war for words on the ground. Strengthening journalism and civil society organisations, justice and accountability, we can show the evidence, not just tell you. That's why we've got PowerPoint slides. But also verified information for things like sanctions and things like that. But our most important one that Reid and I really believe in is the representation of victims and those affected. And I wanted to leave you with this video that was filmed by a person called Sasha on 24th of February 2022. His parents, uh, his sister told his parents not to see him go as he volunteered to go to the front lines. And here he is filming his parents as they salute and wave him off and here he is in tears. His sister got this video from his iCloud he actually called up his parents saying, I love you, I miss you, in May, uh, the year later. And then he was killed defending Azovstal as well. We've shown you so much about how data can be used, but at the end of the day, the reason why we do this work, why we obsess about this work, is the human story and to give accountability to people like Sasha. Thank you so much. I'm Ben Strick. This was Reid Levinson. Really appreciate your time. I think we have some questions. Ah, she's saying no, but you can go. <laughs> we have time for one. We have one minute. Do we have time for one question? One question. One question. Yeah, go for it. Hey, um, amazing presentation. Really great. Thank you. I'm Ginny DiGiovanni. I'm the executive director of the Reckoning Project. We're a war crimes unit in Ukraine. So my question to you is: um, Do you ever? We build cases with our testimonies. Have you ever been turned down with? anything, have prosecutors turned you down with any of the evidence? Because they're very picky and they throw a lot out. And if so, what is that and what can we avoid? Those of us that are case building, um, what specifically should we look out for, pay attention to, and have you, been, have you had cases thrown out because evidence wasn't specific enough? Thank you. I'll just say really quickly, this is a big difference between what Ben does and what I do. We don't give any of our materials to prosecutors. Never. Uh, it's how we keep our reporters safe. We don't work with prosecution of any sort, US police, ICC, but they can use what we've posted online. But Ben at CIR, they have different rules around this. So just to be clear. Because we're on a live stream, I'll answer you off the live stream due to certain obligations. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate your time. <laughs>